I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by board member Stolowski. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the September 26th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am not aware of any changes to tonight's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the meeting met in the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation, and conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under the me board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening. Good evening. Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D3? So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? <clears throat> yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, thank you, Mr. McCall. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Senior Project Specialist, Department of Special Education, and School Safety Manager, Department of School Safety. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Hen. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Stolowski. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Rogers? Thank you. Our first appointment for this evening is Jason Karolkowski. Jason, please stand. Jason is attending. Well, we can give him a round of applause. <laughs> Jason is attending this evening with his wife, Jennifer. Please stand with him and be recognized. He is being appointed to the position of Senior Project Specialist in the Department of Special Education. With 24 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, his experiences include specialist public placement, specialist and resource teacher in the Department of Special Education, and technology resource teacher and classroom teacher at Chatsworth School. Congratulations. <laughs> Second appointment this evening is Richard Muth. 
Richard is being appointed to the position of school safety manager in the Department of School Safety. With almost 11 years of service in Baltimore County Public School, his prior experiences include Specialist Emergency Management Office of School Safety and Interim Executive Director Department of School Safety. His prior experiences before coming to Baltimore County include Executive Director, Maryland Emergency Management Agency, Assistant Chief, Baltimore County Fire Department, Administrator, Baltimore County Office of, of Emergency Preparedness, Firefighter, EMT, Fire Specialist, Lieutenant for the Baltimore County Fire Department, and Shop Payroll Clerk for Baltimore County Highway Department. Congratulations, Mr. Muth. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at, B at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and the Office of School Safety has recommended the following safety and security protocols. Participants should be seated in the room during meetings. Individuals who need to stand should go out into the hallway to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the DS. Materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 <clears throat> by 14 inches. Other items should be left in your seats. Documents to be given to the board are to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting space. Information for other attending attendees is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockdown, lock out or evacuation, staff from the Office of School Safety will direct participants. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a PCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute time clock which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. I will now call on our school system affiliated groups to speak. Our first speaker is Mr. Billy Burke speaking on behalf of CASE. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Oh, sorry. We don't have any school system affiliated groups while moving to unions, and our first speaker is Mr. Billy Park representing CASE. Sorry about that. No worries. Good evening, Chairwoman Lichter, Vice Chair Mrs. Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for letting me speak on behalf of CASE. This month, BCPS and CASE began contract negotiations and budget conversations. CASE's priorities for negotiations remain firm. We ask for fair pay that addresses experience and inflation and general increases in what it costs to have appropriate food and housing. Experience is recognized through step increases. Combating inflation and the increases in basic consumer costs happen through a cost of living adjustment. Last week as part of the monthly union update meeting with Dr. Rogers and her staff, I asked for greater communication and transparency with the board, the county executive, and county council. Dr. Rogers spoke of regular open communication with Baltimore County government, and I am encouraged by that. You've heard me speak about this before. It is disappointing at best when the union spend a year negotiating the terms of the contract and making suggestions for the budget, only to find out that the county executive and the county and council were not supportive of the ask. We need feedback and information on the state of the budget during the development of both the contracts and the budget. That would mean unions need quarterly meetings with BCPS staff, the board, and Baltimore County government. Case's priorities for the budget also remain firm. The staffing shortage remains the greatest stressor 
for teachers and administrators and staff. Please focus your budget discussions on strategies that address the staffing shortage. Strategies that address the staffing shortage naturally address hiring, retention, culture, and morale. In the past, I've spoken about the need for more resources in special education. We need to continue to try and staff elementary schools with IEP facilitators. The work-life balance of most assistant principals is non-existent. Assistant principals should be focused on instruction and student performance so there is a pipeline of people ready to lead schools. But assistant principals spend much of their time addressing student behavior, transportation, testing, and after-school activities. We need staffing strategies that support administrators with tasks not related to instruction so they can concentrate on being instructional leaders. Research tells us that teachers stay when they feel supported. We need to make sure administrators have the time and expertise to support. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CASE. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton from TAPCO. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. I have so many thoughts as this school year has started. It has been a relatively smooth start, and there is an air of hope with our educators. We know there is work to be continued, discipline, cell phones, and yes, MCAP, and other such scores. But as I visit schools, I can feel the difference. And I thank you, Dr. Rogers, your team, and the school board. Our school community needs that hope, and we must all focus on the work that will help our students succeed and, of course, retain our educators. I want to quickly comment on the school calendar you're looking at tonight. Please be sure to use the lens of what is best for our students, what gives them the most beneficial instructional time before standardized tests and the like. Students living in poverty, English language learners, and those who receive special ed services, these are targeted group who are among our most needy academically. What calendar best serves their needs? And I simply must speak about the need for safety for all of our students. We practice ALICE drills, we talk about weapon detection devices, and we speak about mental health needs and more. We have been working as a country for decades on racial equity and safety, and we also now add equity for our LGBTQ plus students. It's part of the work we must do. I have so many thoughts and emotions about the safety of all our students, and especially the most marginalized, the most bullied, and the ones who need us to stand up for them because sometimes school is their only safe place. Our trans students are not dangerous. I was going to share data about how our LGBT plus students are bullied more frequently, consider suicide more frequently, and are more likely not to have a safe place at home. But for now, I will just remind you of Board Policy 0100, which states, while complex societal and historical factors contribute to the inequities our students face, rather than perpetuating disparities, the school system must address and overcome inequity by providing all students with the opportunity to succeed. Students who are typically the least safe in our schools, schools are our marginalized students. Let us not find ways to make it more difficult for them, but ways to support them and help them in their journeys so our schools, community, and society can be kinder, more accepting, caring places. Students can't learn if they don't feel safe. TABCO stands at the ready to do this work with you, Dr. Rogers, your team, and this board. We must act now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next group is individual citizens or students, and our first speaker is Sharon Serhoff. Good evening. Good evening. I want to start with a compliment. Okay. Um, this goes to Allison Myers for hiring, or I should say, hiring back 
um, an individual into a new position of uh, parent engagement liaison, I believe it's called. Um, Kenya Golden is doing an amazing job for the beginning of the school year. I have worked with her on a couple of cases recently as far as getting um, concerns addressed. And for the first time, I'm feeling heard on those cases. So I'm complimenting this particular idea. Um, she is one person, however, and she needs help. So we need to give it to her. We need to support her. Um, on that note, I have still a couple of clients that are not in school. And I believe this is, what, week six? We're, in, we're on interims right now, folks. Students should be in school, not sitting at home waiting for a placement. Um, Kenya and I are working on those things. But in order to work on these things, we need a clear process that parents, educators, IEP chairs, and administrators have to follow, and we don't have a clear process. We need to have it written down so that when we go into an IEP meeting, Parents know exactly what their rights are. The IEP chair knows what their rights are. The administrators know what their rights are and how to proceed. I shouldn't be getting emails from clients telling me, well, I can't, they're telling me I can't say this and I can't say that, and they show me the email, and that's concerning. I shouldn't be getting agreements that say, in order for a students to get into a placement, they have to waive FAPE, free and appropriate public education. And yes, I have seen such an agreement. But that's not the case for everybody. And that's why I'm saying that process needs to be clear, needs to be the same, and needs to be written down. And if we have to make a new policy, then let's get going. Thank you. Thank you. Our next, next speaker is, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, Tony De Caesar? 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 Perfect. Perfect. Which one? I did three different tries. You know, Caesar, okay. Who, all right. My first one was right. Mr. De Caesar. Good evening. good evening. All right, good evening, members of the board, Dr. Rogers. Um, I want to address a couple of things. So currently, our students are navigating an existential physical and mental health crisis that needs to be addressed. I've done a lot of work on this. Childhood obesity rates have more than tripled over the last four decades. Teen suicide rates have more than doubled from 2008 to 2018. There has been a dramatic spike in ADHD medication usage. Uh, post-pandemic, and they are faced with a decade-long trend of declining mental health by teenagers where 42% now report feelings of hopelessness and sadness. In January 2023, the Maryland Department of Education reported student performance has not returned to pre-pandemic levels in mathematics. In fact, math proficiency percentages for grades 3 through 8 combined decreased from 33% in 2018-19 to 22% in 2021-2022. Obviously, what we are doing isn't working and something needs to change. What I'm proposing is not a change in the curriculum, but an entire paradigm shift. A suburban school district outside of Chicago <clears throat> is proving this point. The Naperville, Illinois district implemented an early morning exercise program called Zero Hour which sought to determine whether working out before school gives students a boost in their reading ability and other subjects. Since introducing the program, the district has seen remarkable results in both wellness and academic performance. Research from across the country shows students with higher fitness scores also have higher test scores. 
In fact, physical activity has a positive influence on memory, concentration, and classroom behavior. Indirectly, exercise improves mood and sleep, and it reduces stress and anxiety. Problems in these areas frequently cause or contribute to cognitive impairment. As someone who has been involved in the health, fitness, and nutrition industry for over 30 years, I feel we need to return to the standards established by the President's Council on Physical Fitness and begin implementing regular daily physical activity for our students. Virtual learning and sedentary activities have been a colossal failure to this generation of students, and we need to pivot back to physical and outdoor activities to improve the physical and mental health as well as the academics. And I have resource documents for everybody with all the, uh, the information on there. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody should be. You can just put it on the there down you. and somebody will get it for us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bobby Brooks. Good evening. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Bobby Jo Brooks. <clears throat> I am a mother of children enrolled in Baltimore County Public Schools and a long-term resident of Baltimore County. I am here today with intentions to reach your hearts. I speak with an abundance of love for everyone, but especially our vulnerable children. I've walked 38 years in this body, going through all of the changes within myself, acknowledging the differences between my brothers and I. Now watching my children go through those same changes, puberty, growth spurts, hygiene, et cetera, and taking notes on the different ways I must respond to each of them. They are each unique in their own way, but also unique to their responses in growth when it comes to their sex. I think I can speak for all of the attendants here today. In adolescence, we all get that feeling of no one understands me. I want to be independent and grown, yet still crave the safety and protection of being a child. These private conversations in our bathrooms and locker rooms, while sharing our similarities and experiences with others of the same sex, help mold us to help us understand ourselves better. We take away that privacy. We have taken away that child's outlet. And let's be real, we already feel like the world doesn't understand us at that age. And just to add in the uncomfortableness of asking for a tampon from a female peer. Remember that feeling, ladies? We could comfortably ask for that in our bathrooms. I have walked the path of a woman. I have specific needs in particular to my body that I can only guide my daughters through. When a problem arises with my son, physically or mentally, I have to pull my spouse aside to get his advice because he has lived it and he has walked that path. That is why we teach history, correct? Or any subject in that matter. The experience of living it is what gives us the truth. If I want to be a better musician, I hire a musician. Look at our textbooks. The one who was experienced in math wrote our math books. It is the chemist who wrote the chemistry books. As our youth is maturing, they will need to look to that man and woman who have experienced that life for their truth. And that's who you feel comfortable learning from. And to reiterate what I have already previously said, my 12-year-old daughter is going to be looking for those conversations in those bathrooms, looking for those people who have experienced it. And now let's look at the safety aspect of all of it. I think the truth of the matter is behind closed doors is where people go to do mischievous things. If pupils have an argument, it's more than likely going to happen in the bathroom. Regardless or not, or whether a male identifies as a woman, he still has the physical prowess of a male which means scientifically he has more absolute strength. So if it just so happens to be a male is having an argument with a female, the potential for that male to cause harm to that female has now increased, which leaves our daughters extremely vulnerable, even more so vulnerable in that bathroom. And that's not even mentioning the ones that specifically go into the bathroom with the intention to sexually harass. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you listening. Please consider this when deciding to have a separate restroom for our Thank you. Our next speaker is MJ Fracker. Fraker. I'm sorry, Fraker. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to ex exercise my First Amendment guaranteeing me the rights to express my beliefs and my opinions without forced censorship. 
My name is Mary J. Fraker. I am a U.S. citizen, defender of truth and justice, and I am a female who is standing up and speaking against the pro-trans bathroom and locker room policies. I believe in freedom and I roar for freedom. Science documents that there are only two genders. Um, the, the Y chromosome is a female, and excuse me, the X chromosome is a female and the Y chromosome is a male. This can never ever be changed. A boy or a girl can change their outward structure, but when they take a blood test, their DNA stays the same, male or female. It never changes, it never ever changes. So why would the board of education bow down and being cowards to not push back, protecting not just a certain sector of students, but all the students. Why are they given special attention? Why did the Board of Education decide to make parental decisions for students on their own behalf and not the parents? Who is ensuring protection for all of these students? Safety, oh my goodness, and enforced safety for all students. Not just for one, but for all. What happens when a, young, when a man says that he is a girl and he goes into the bathroom or goes into the locker room and all of a sudden his equipment starts working and he wants to express that equipment on a girl and then he pushes himself Himself on that, and then there's a rape, there's four sex. What happens? What happens to that? Is there a particular excuse? A Sorry, I think your comments are not talking about public education at this point. What is, what is the statement that you're trying to make? So what I'm trying to make is just like the other person that was speaking that how can they have, how can they learn when they're afraid to even go to the bathroom that there are girls that I know that hold their body until they get home and to relieve themselves. So that's what I'm trying to um, bring forth is about the safety issue. Okay, thank you. Okay, and that is hindering their education. Okay, so responsibility to stand up is not just for one, but it's for all. And it's not just to put on a garment and take the garment off. It is a 24 by seven responsibility. You each have probably have children, grandchildren. How are you teaching them? What are you telling them to do in order to enforce this safety for them so that they can learn freely what they need to learn in a school system. When I was in a school system, I didn't have these things that were against me, but I also had parents that supported me, and I'm so grateful for that. So I say to you today, why don't we be just like the presidents, like Ronald Reagan, who took responsibility to enforce freedom on June 12, 1987. He said, Gorbachev, tear down these walls. I decree today, the Baltimore Board of Education, tear up the pro-trans bathroom and, and locker room policies right now. And I thank you for this time. Thank you. The next speaker is Arya Kazamina. Did I get that? How bad did I do? Very close. Arya Kazemia. Okay, Kazemia. Yes, right there. Thank you. No, it's okay. You're fine. Good evening. Good evening to the chair, vice chair, superintendent, and members of the board. My name is Arya Kazemnia, and I'm here today as a member of the First Tech Challenge Team 23741 and a former Baltimore County Public School student. As a curious elementary schooler, I love space and astronauts. I mean, who didn't? Throughout my time in elementary school at Cromwell Valley Elementary, my teachers sought to integrate my interests into all the subjects we learned in class. In my kindergarten reading group, I was paired with students who liked, to read, uh, who liked science, and we learned about trees and stars through the books we read. Throughout first and second grade, I was encouraged to explore my interests through various creative projects and lessons. Our school had Scratch and Lego EV3 robots to teach the students about coding in STEM. In fifth grade, our school participated in events run by Code to the Future, which exposed students of all grade levels to coding and robotics. However, on my trip back to my elementary school, none of these programs are still there. This isn't an isolated incident, however. Many Baltimore County public school STEM programming only lasts for a year or two before the lessons are gone. To adequately prepare our students for the future, we need to integrate STEM lessons and challenges into the Baltimore County Public School curriculum as part of science, English, and math classes. As you can see here, the National, uh, the National Science Foundation lists Maryland as one of the states where 11.2 to 15% of the state's workforce has a degree in STEM. And many of these students, 51% of them, were exposed to some inter interdisciplinary STEM program in school. Interdisciplinary STEM could look like teaching about how plants grow in Stein's class, the measuring and calculating the growth rates in math class, and reading about how George Washington Carver utilized car, uh, crop rotations to increase plant growth rates, which could introduce students to diverse stories. This would allow students to be exposed to STEM within their, all their classes and obtain an interest in the STEM field. 
Furthermore, educating our county students in STEM will allow them to enter the workforce, workforce in a high paying field, regardless of their socioeconomic background. Interdisciplinary STEM practices are a key to building a more equitable curriculum to, for our county and leveling the socioeconomic playing field. The National Science and Technology Council wrote in a 2018 report that modern STEM education promotes not only skills such as critical thinking, uh, problem solving, higher order thinking, design and inference, but also behavioral competencies such as uh, perseverance, adaptability, cooperation, organization, and responsibility. Allowing students with all interests to grow individually and as a collective, preparing them with real world experience that they will encounter in their prof professional careers. The interpersonal career, uh, skills gained through interdisciplinary STEM education are vital soft skills in any workplace. The time is now for our county to update its STEM practices and prepare our students for a rapidly progressing future. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speakers are for board policy 8131 and the first speaker is Sharon Sa Okay, thank you. Our next speaker for policy 8131 is Dr. Ferrone. Good evening. Good evening to all. This is a critique and not criticism. She's ready. <laughs> Line eight. <laughs> the Board of Education talks about uh, formal session. However, I don't see in the policy that uh, there is a rule about informal sessions. So as a public speaker, I really don't know whether you meet in, in closed session or some other uh, form is informal and what applies to it. Grammar-wise, not a big deal. Line seven, I think formal sessions would be better grammar. Line uh, 11 talks about the superintendent taking actions, immediate actions, if there is no guidance by policy or by the board. And uh, shall be subject to the review, line 12, uh, by action of the board in next regular meeting. And then it says the superintendent to inform the board promptly, promptly. So here's my question. Why do we need to give permission to the superintendent to act? I mean, to me, it's, you know, we hire superintendent to do the work of, of the school system. And why the board would not really be in this day and age available, you know, in a time of Zoom, Teams, uh, phones, artificial intelligence, etc. For the superintendent to inform the Board of Education per policy promptly I'm really concerned about that because promptly is, has different meaning uh, to different people. And it can uh, basically draw um, what is done really in hospitals. People come Monday morning, it's Monday morning quarterback. And I don't think that's really fair for the superintendent. Next item in that policy is nothing contained here in shall limit the authority of the superintendent. And I have three boards under my belt, but I really don't understand that. Why mention it, you know, altogether? Uh, the superintendent cannot really violate state, county, federal law, you know? So I, I don't get it why the policy states the obvious. Now, in the past, I always criticized for vague language that allows too much leeway that can be used against a teacher or employee. Here I see the obvious being stated and I just don't get it. I hope you can answer me. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the public comment portion of the meeting. The next item on the agenda is contract awards. And for that, I call on Ms. Harvey. <laughs> Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm 
I was trying to stall them. <laughs> That's quite all right. The members of the members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee postponed this contract on June 12, 2023, contract MWE 806-23 comprehensive maintenance plan until the comprehensive maintenance plan could be updated with information that was not available at the time. Therefore, item G1 is coming to the board without a recommendation from the committee. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve item G1? So moved, Young. Is there a second? Second, Harvey. Any discussion? I have a question. That's the comprehensive maintenance plan, right? Correct. So I, I did have a couple of questions um, about the plan. Um, one second, we're going to get some staff to come up. Dr. Grimm and, and So thank you. This is truly a comprehensive plan. Um, <laughs> so the title is fitting. I had a question of, on page 13, uh, custodial, and then you have A, B, and my question was around B, um, the percentage of custodial duties completed adequately. And so it has, for, as an FY23 goal, 100%. FY23 actual 53%, then FY24 100%. It seems like the goal for FY24 may be unrealistic based off of the goal, the actual for FY23. So could you speak a little bit, and I haven't seen you know FY22 actual, maybe if it was at 100% at for the FY22 actual, but um, to go from 53% to 100, I'm just, I wasn't, could you just speak a little bit to how we, how we plan on getting there and why that number is realistic? So I can I can start, and part of the challenge is our pages aren't quite numbered in the same way on the report. Oh. So that we do know, you know that that's a challenge. I know you're referring to that chart. Um, when it takes a look in, in snapshot in our goals, correct? Right. So typically our, our goals for the most part, um, when, you're, when you're looking at the duties completed ac ac adequately are 100% because adequate completion would be 100%. I'll ask Mr. Dixit and Mr. Roberts if they can maybe speak a little bit more to why we were at 53% uh, last year. So I'll share with you what I know, and then I'll give it to Mr. Robert. What we are indicating here that custodial duties that have been completed adequately are 50%, 53%, and our goal remains at 100%. So it is a continuously improving, a continuous improvement process. So it's our goal to go back to try, try to do 100%. Have you ever hit 100%? Well, the goal always remains 100%. If you see in uh, in the first question, the number of per the percentage of custodians trained on the LEAs, it is 100%. But our goal remains 100%, knowing that we'll hit somewhere close to it, may never be perfect, but we keep striving. And so I'm just thinking about just goal setting and like effective practices for goal setting mm -hmm. and just kind of looking at, well, what is the root causes as to why we're not getting at the 100 percent and then maybe setting some incremental targets. So maybe it's, you know, you go from 53 to 70 percent and then FY 25, you go to 100 so that you're, you know, as a part of that continuous improvement process. Um, so, so that was my only concern. I, I think your statement is correct, but our goal remains that we try to do it as good as we can. And that's exactly what it is. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> and Ms. Booker Dwyer, I think if you look at a few of the other goals as well, you're, you're correct. For example, the number, our, our work orders and the completion of those, that's a little bit more finite that we can track. Yes. So I think one of the challenges that we have are when, when you look at um, the completion of a duty being adequately completed, part of that relates back to our, our staffing. 
and, and how we're supporting our staff in schools to be able to um, reach these goals. So when we say adequately, um, we know if we could do things a little bit differently, we would. Um, so that's why that goal remains 100%. But I think your point about incremental change is well worthwhile. And no, I don't think we've ever hit 100%. <laughs> And then on page 12, I just had a question about um, the 60,000, so the item number five, it went from, what, 80 to 60,000. Um, is, is that because, so if I'm reading this right, we increased the number of workers, so we don't need as many contractors. Is that why? Could you just speak a little bit to the decrease from 80,000? to 60,000 on, um, well, okay, it's the corrective CM section, line five, the total number of contractor hours spent on CM work. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, in this uh, current budget cycle, uh, we had the benefit of adding five additional preventive maintenance technicians in-house. Yep. So that'll reduce the number of hours that we'll require from contracted services. Oh, so that's perfect. that number. Yep. yep, that's all my questions. Thanks. Penn? Thank you. Um, I had submitted questions on this in advance. So in the interest of time, I would appreciate if staff could provide written responses to those questions. I'll ask a few now, but I don't want to um, take up too much of everyone's time this evening. Okay, thank you. I would ask Madam Chair to facilitate that. Um, my first question is, good evening, gentlemen. Um, the IAC recently released its FY23 maintenance report, uh, maintenance of Maryland's public school buildings. And in that report, they cite that a well-conceived CMP uses comparable metrics to determine if maintenance is being performed as required. My question is, how does our fiscal year 24 CMP meet that above that requirement? How does it address the use of metrics to determine if maintenance is being performed as required? And how does it address the reporting and compliance monitoring of school maintenance, which is also a recommendation of the IAC? So, the so I'll go ahead, Mr. Dixon. So first of all, thank you for that question. Thank you for bringing up the IAC report because uh, we're very proud. We received that report on Friday as well. And uh, in that report, uh, BCPS is actually third among all LEAs in our comprehensive maintenance uh, percentage, our goals. Um, Chris Roberts, our, our director in facilities support, um, has really done an outstanding job of making sure that we are maintaining our schools. So with that being said, um, and having really the third oldest infrastructure in the state, um, the CMP actually addresses the use of comparable metrics in two ways. It compares BCPS's fiscal year goals and the actual data for preventative and corrective maintenance tasks, and that's on pages 12 and 13. And second, by comparing BCPS against industry standards, um, the Association of Physical Plant Administrators, pages 18 to 20. So the CMP is required reporting document, as we will point out, and the IAC maintenance effectiveness assessment is really the assessment or the uh, compliance component of this. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. My second question is, what is the status of the use of the computerized maintenance management system, CMMS? Um, we had selected Brightly for tracking and managing all assets and work orders. And what is the plan if Brightly does not meet that capability to acquire the capability? So, Chris, can you answer that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we have a robust comprehensive maintenance management system in, in Brightly, as you referenced. So we utilize that for the tracking of all work orders. So that's all of our corrective, emergent, and our preventive maintenance tickets. So it, it is an excellent tool, and it meets that goal for us very well. Um, for asset tracking, um, we track all of our critical uh, assets, all of those uh, pertaining to life, safety, and health. So, and we're continuing to grow our asset tracking in that. So our goal ultimately is to get everything, but we have all of our critical assets in there now, and we're continuing to build that uh, portfolio, if you will, in the CMMS system. Thank you. So just a follow up, we have the capability we need in the Brightly system to be able to track all of our assets. I think the report referenced 17, 16 or 17 facilities that were being tracked. 
Currently. It's pro assets, probably not facilities. Um, but yes, yes. So we do have the capability, and it's just a matter of, um, as you can imagine, with 175 facilities, the number of assets is um, innumerable, if you will. So yes, we have we have the capability, and we continue to build, um, you know, each year. Okay, thank you. And just to add, Ms. Hen, there there was what's noted in the report um, with some of the assets that Mr. Roberts is referring to, the. The, the assets weren't tracking as well as they could among assets, uh, the, the assets essentials, Chris, if I'm saying that correctly, and other parts of that system. So um, they have been working with Brightly to rectify that, and that's why there's some manual tracking at this time. Uh, certainly, if we don't believe the that Brightly is the best software for us, we will um, come back to the board. But at this time, it is meeting our needs in a number of other areas. Perfect, thank you for that clarification. And my last question is, the CMP references internal and external facilities assessments. Where can the public locate these assessments and have they been provided um, to the IAC for input into um, their plan? And how can the board access those? So some of, some of the uh, some of the reporting that you had asked for are actually individual to schools. So for example, uh, fire marshal's report is individual to a specific school. It goes to the specific school. They are not, uh, those documents are not kept centrally in a master file at this particular point in time. Um, so they are not publicly available except perhaps through a PIA request to the individual school. Um, the other uh, reports, we, we do have some links that we can provide to the board for where certain documents are located. Um, everything that uh, we are to report to the IAC has been reported and shared with them. Thank you. So for instance, the MABE report, um, the report references an annual MABE assessment, which mm -hmm. I was not familiar with. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that assessment. Um, that would be helpful. Um, to provide to the board, you you see no problem with sharing that publicly. So there is no there is no MABE master report. Those are for individual school sites. So we don't we don't have a master file of those. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Other questions? Miss, nope. Okay, then may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski. Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Jaleski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Burns. Good evening. Good evening. Madam Chair, Dr. Rogers, members of the board, um, be in closed session, you considered and took action on two appeal cases. One was case number SD23-04, a discipline case. The other was case number HE23-35, a residency case. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiners case HE 23-35 and SD 2022-23-04. So moved. And authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Young. Thank you. <laughs> Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Abstain. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session with respect to approved litigation? So I move Stileski. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Young? Mr. Young, sorry? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. 
Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Uh, Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is new business, report on board policies. This is the first reader for this policy, and for that I call Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation of the proposed changes to board policy 8131, organization, administration, and policy absence. This policy is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit 1. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for board policy 8131? So moved, Dominowski. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the proposed 2024-2025 school calendar. And for that, I call Ms. Charlie Green and Ms. Bilski. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Tonight I'm here with Manager of Staff Relations, Ms. Joelle Bilski, to bring forward for the board's consideration a proposed 2024-2025 school calendar um, as required by uh, board policy and superintendent's rule 6301. So at this time I'll turn it over to Ms. Bilski to share with you the work of the committee and the proposed calendar. There is a PowerPoint, if we could, okay. So in accordance with board policy and superintendent's rule 6301, the superintendent is charged with convening a committee to assist in the development of a school calendar. The calendar committee meets 16 months prior to the school year for which the committee is making the calendar recommendation. The calendar is to be presented to the board no later than the first regular meeting in October. The calendar committee met on May 8th, 2023 and May 15th, 2023 to develop a calendar for the 2024-2025 school year. By a majority vote, the calendar committee recommended a pre-Labor Day start calendar for the 2024-2025 school year. 11 votes were, were for pre-Labor Day and five votes were for post-Labor Day. And so board members have, have uh, access to the PowerPoint. Obviously, it was in board docs. Um, if you would like us to continue, we can. If you prefer that we wait for the slides for members of the public, we will do that as well. I think you can keep going because okay. we have the slides and then we'll make sure that they're included on the Great. board. Thank you. So um, there are a variety of stakeholders were involved with the calendar committee. Um, we had school administrators from all, level, all levels from across the system. Um, we had representatives from offices across the system and then um, community stakeholders, for example, the um, Central Area Advisory Committee rep, Southeast Area Advisory Committee rep, um, the presidents of each of the unions also p participated in the calendar committee. Okay, I, can you pause for a second because I think we may be in violations of Open Meetings Act with not having the slides. No? Mr. Burns, clarification, P point of order. Uh, board, uh, Darren Burns, Board Council. I think they're posted to the public site. They're accessible to the public. Okay. Discussing them uh, in, in the public eye and public ear. I think the convenience of the public, though, is 
Okay. Okay. It's coming. We need the Jeopardy music. Do, 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 do. <gasps> that means <laughs> something happened. Oh, then then there it is. And the question is oh, there it is. Okay. Which slide are you on? We are on the third slide. Okay. One Thank more. you for your patience, everyone. One more, please. There we Thank go. You. Thank you so much. Maryland state law dictates both the minimum number of school days and the minimum number of student contact hours that must be met annually by all Maryland school systems. School calendars must be comprised of a minimum of 180 student days, offering elementary and middle school students 1,080 contact hours and high school students 1,170 contact hours. Next slide, please. State law also spells out holidays to be observed in Maryland's public schools and minimally included in all school calendars. Those 14 days are depicted on this slide. The slide does not include BCPS days off, such as spring break closures beyond, beyond the Friday before Easter and the Monday after Easter. Juneteenth is also recognized as a state mandated holiday. However, this holiday falls outside the school year with a pre-Labor Day start. This slide indicates the number of professional development days to be included in the school calendar. The Friday before Easter and Monday after Easter are included in slide four, state mandated public school holidays. The total student closure days, including state mandated public school holidays, teacher professional development days, and other school closure days listed on this current slide for the 24-25 school year totals 25 days. Next slide, please. Thank you. Actually, one more slide, please. Thank you. The kindergarten readiness assessment, this slide depicts the, the um, conversation and the data behind the pre-Labor Day um, start. The kindergarten readiness assessment, re MSDE requires the census administra administration of the KRA. This assessment includes both individual direct performance task and observational components. The non-negotiable MSDE deadline for administration is October 11th, 2024. The pre-Labor Day start provides kindergarten teachers an additional five days to administer this comprehensive the MCAPs, PSAT, SAT, and Advanced Placement exams. The pre-Labor Day start provides elementary and secondary students an additional five days of instruction in preparation for various assessments that being, early, that being in the early winter and run through May. The graduation day for seniors does not change. The pre-Labor Day provides seniors with five additional days which they would lose with a post-Labor Day start. Some, some summer camps stop mid-August, so the pre-Labor Day start allows students to return one week earlier. Working parents would not have to look for childcare when camp ends. Students will not be home un unsupervised. And then student enrollment data is required to be reported to the state by September 30th. The pre-Labor Day start provides secretaries five additional days to get students enrolled. If students are not enrolled by the non-negotiable September 30th, 2024 deadline, there is no funding for that, that student. Next slide, please. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Questions, Ms. Dominowski? So um, I know they, for the um, summer school options for the kids that need extra help. Is there any data showing the um, enrollment success for having that in start in early July? Like, I mean, those that it's offered to and those that, actu those that actually show up for it? Is there, do we have any like data to show that attendance versus um, actualization? I mean, so I will, Dr. Rogers, certainly if you don't mind me responding, I think that one of the things that we have noticed about our offerings over the last couple of years is that they have
voluntary and not required. And so one of the things that we're looking to do is to require that attendance. So in order to do kind of a comprehensive look at that attendance rate, we would like to make sure that it's not just an offer, but it is actually a requirement that students attend. Um, I don't know if we have additional data on student attendance and that, that, um, that correlation, um, and we certainly can look into that. I think my, my reason for asking is I feel like that month of July is a very busy time for families to go on vacation, especially around the 4th of July. I mean, mm -hmm. I know we're, in, we're on vacation last week in June, first two weeks in July. That's a long vacation for us, I know. But I'm, in general, I think it's, it's a hard, and I, my child was offered that, but I couldn't, we weren't there half the time because it was, I, I don't want to make them come home from vacation. Or, and also, uh, when we get that notice, it's late in the year, and we have to make a decision for camp because those camps close up. And I have a full-time job, so I need that. And if we could get, if there's a way to get that information to the students quicker so that that decision can be made by the parent. Because I know I want my child to be there. I, I, he could use the extra work. But trying to juggle it all with the job and camp and, and family, it's, it's, it's and hard. My, and my apologies. I think no, I misunderstood no, your I, question. I, I, no, no. I, I misunderstood your yeah. question. Dr. Rogers, you wanted to offer a comment? Sure, um, I can share that we're already uh, currently in conversations about the summer for 2024, even though October is not here yet. <laughs> so you can absolutely expect advance notice about our offerings for students and staff. Other questions, Ms. Booker Dwyer? So I, I appreciate this calendar. I know how hard it is to create the calendar. And when I look at the calendar, I feel like this is a, a calendar for compliance. And I'm wondering how can we maximize student learning? And if we could think of some innovative ways and take advantage of that for this planning opportunity um, with the calendar now while we're also negotiating teacher contracts. So for instance, why do we still have half days? We know that attendance goes, um, it, it declines on a half day. We, I charge any board member to go into a Baltimore County school during a half day to see the quality of instruction that's happening or not happening. And so could we have a, um, a calendar at least where we're maximizing student learning by either you have the full day or give them the day off. But the half day is just, to me, it doesn't work well for families and it doesn't work well for student learning because oftentimes students are watching videos, there's makeup work to be done, which is great, but then if you're a student who's, who's done all your work, then you're either given busy work or you're just there on your phone. And so um, I think that's like a low hanging fruit that if we could look at reimagining the half day. The second thing, and, and dare I say it, um, year round school perhaps, um, or spreading out the 180 days so that we can minimize the summer learning loss. I mean, I don't think we have to do it forever, but until our students can begin to show a higher rate of proficiency on the MCAPs and, and those types of assessment, especially as we enter into this blueprint phase, um, we may need to kind of all just buckle down and get our kids into school, still 180 days, but spread that across a longer window so that you're not having this huge summer learning loss. And then every, you know, it's the same thing every year. I feel like these calendars have been the same since the 80s. The only thing that has changed is pre-labor they start and so this is our opportunity now to do some things that are innovative we can apply for waivers from the state but um, at a bare minimum let's get rid of these half days but if we could go year-round or if we could go minimize that summer break I would I would love it thank you mr. McMillian I think mr. Dreyer has a book of Dreyer has an excellent idea about year-round school and if, if somehow the, you know, somebody could do a presentation on what's going on, you know, what are school systems around the country doing? I've ran into, in my travels, and this was years ago, there's, there's been school systems that have done this for years, and they rotate the time off, and it's some really creative ways out there. And that might be something that really spurs an improvement in the performance, if we look at that. Uh, it's, it's something to seriously, look outside the box and, and come up with some ideas that, that maybe we decide to pursue it or maybe not, but at least we have the opportunity to, to examine it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the idea. Well, I would uh, like to thank both board member uh, Booker Dwyer as well as board member McMillian uh, for talking about innovative ways for us to schedule students. What I'm going to call back to the attention 
of our board is FY25 is a very tight fiscal challenging year. Uh, with that being said, you know, for the uh, ESSER fiscal cliff as well as the blueprint um, reserves, the portion that is being allocated to school districts is much smaller in FY25 compared to the upcoming years. With that being said, um, I think everyone is clear that our commitment is to academic achievement. So perhaps we, our first step is to identify whether or not there are uh, funds that exist for some kind of pilot and an appetite exists for that. Um, but I would say that the, uh, the real first step, if we're looking at evidence-based strategies for uh, working on systemic improvement of students, students who need it the most, um, that has to do with the kinds of programs that we're offering over the summer. And as Ms. Charlie Green said, our offerings can't be opportunities and offerings. We need to communicate early, as Ms. Dominowski said. We need to communicate often. We need to make it uh, convenient for families. And we need to make some requirements. And then we have a comparison to say whether or not what we're offering meets the needs of students. While we can take a look at some creative options, perhaps with uh, lead grant funding uh, that allows us to look at school time differently, whether or not there are some options for our most, um, our schools that are most in need of innovative ways to move forward with uh, scheduling time. There's um, a comment from Ms. Frempong I want to read. Um, she says it's always tough in creating a calendar to account for holidays, required hours, professional development, required student days, teacher days, et cetera, and she wants to thank the committee for their work. Um, and her question is, does the calendar still include mental health days? Yes. Okay. Yes, Ms. Frampong, it, it does. Um, there was a hand, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I agree with Ms. Booker Dwyer's comments regarding the half days, that we need to think outside the box and think about how we use that time more effectively. Our educators tell us they want more professional development. We know we need it. Um, we've seen that link to um, increased student success. Is there an opportunity to better use that time, give teachers the PD that they, they're asking for that we know they need? and to give our students uh, other opportunities because that, um, as Ms. Booker Dwyer said, we, the learning may, <laughs> is likely not taking place on those half days anyway, so how can we make the best use of the, those hours? Ms. Hen, I would thank you for that question. And again, um, and Chair, we are uh, deeply entrenched in conversations around professional learning. We know second to uh, high evidence-based curriculum, you need quality professional learning for our teachers. Just as recently as last week, we sent out to all of our leaders information about training, how we're gonna use our system-wide professional development days throughout the year to meet the needs of teachers and provide them with that professional learning, as well as how we're going to track that in our professional learning system to make sure that everyone has the training that they need and we're working on a summer plan now. And so I think you have a uh, large group of people who are coming together committed to enhancing the type of professional development that we provide and more information as we provide reports to the board and to the community about what that will look like in creative ways next year. Great. Thank you, Thanks. Dr. Rogers. Ms. Teleski, did you want to make a comment or just through the chat? Okay. Um, any other? Ms. Harvey? Uh, thank you for the presentation and the thoughtfulness in developing the calendar. I think the board is expressing, or the members of the board are expressing that we have an appetite for some innovation in how we uh, develop the calendar. I would also, you know, traditionally school, a uh, year long school is like a 45, 15 split where there's 45 days in school and 15 days out of school and it's spread throughout the year. But we should consider how child care and those kinds of things are impacted when parents have to provide those services or make arrangements for their children throughout the year for those kinds of stretches of time. I do believe that the uh, learning loss that we're experiencing and the gap that we're trying to close around that is important and that in our innovation offering um, high dose tutoring or other ways that we can impact um, the way that our children are learning uh, is also a consideration. And uh, I do think half days 
could be utilized better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Domenowski? Just one quick little, um, I, I agree with your point. Um, I think that something a, a year-round school wouldn't be something we could implement you know, in 2025 or 2026. It's something we had to look down further down the range so that we give parents the opportunity to get ready for that. But I also want to say as having younger children, I know that I, if I was to call my in-laws and say, can you take the kids for three days as opposed to three weeks, they're going to take three days. <laughs> so that's just my point. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? This is the first reader of the proposed 2024, 20, <laughs> um, there's a typo, 2024-2025 school calendar. The public hearing on the calendar will be held during the next board meeting on Tuesday, October 10th, 2023, during the public comment agenda item with the second reader and consideration of the calendar on Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. Okay, thank you, ladies. Thank you. Whoops. Book so, could, so I want to move that we are presented a calendar that does not have half days. Second, Ms. Han. Any discussion? Maybe we have. Go ahead, Ms. Dr. Rogers. Yes, I just uh, wanted to raise to everyone awareness. If you remove all of the half days, uh, there's an impact on grading and reporting days that happen quarterly, uh, which I believe may be part of the negotiated agreement. And additionally, the board has voted at least the last two years to provide those mental health days to staff and students. I believe probably co-sponsored by our student member of the board, rec uh, identifying the needs of students uh, monthly. So just want to um, raise that to the awareness of everyone. So Ms. Hen? Um, unless Ms. Booker-Dwyer would like to speak to her motion first. No, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'll speak to my second. Um, I'd like to explore the possibility. And I think the, the mem many members of the board have expressed support for this concept. And c considering that we're, um, we have a couple of weeks to to consider it, what options exist. Um, maybe it's not all of the half days immediately, maybe it's eliminating two, but we need to think creatively. We're asking for innovation. Um, if you come back to us and say, this this really is impossible, we can't make it work this year, that's one thing. But I'm supporting this motion because I think we need to start somewhere. And yeah, that's why I support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tileski. Um, there are a number of health um, half days, excuse me, that I think are labeled as the mental health days. So the contracted days for the grade reporting might not be able to be part of a reimagined um, calendar. Um, but you know, I, I would wonder if we were to survey students, teachers on the impact of the half days that are the mental health days, might they be in agreement that a reimagined um, creation of the mental health support, but also better use of the half days would be ideal. Thank you. I just have one. So a half day mental health day is not a mental health day. You need a day. Um, and so I'm concerned that if you do need that mental health day and you're there for that half day, what's happening? Um, and so I just did. So if you need a mental health day, take the day and tend to your mental health. Thank you. Um, Ms. Frempong asked a question. Are we able to hear why the pre-calendar was chosen over the post-Labor Day calendar? I think that was on that slide. What, Correct. Right. So um, it, it, the calendar committee voted on it, and then um, and it was 11 to, to 5 okay. pre-Labor Day. And we'd have to just, as a note, be mindful of the number of hours we are required to be in front of children. And so if we make these half days, full days off, that is going to directly impact the hours in front of kids. Okay. So just, just a note for that. So there is, there is an MSD requirement related to the number of days, but also the number of hours that students must attend. And those half days are counted as, you know, meeting either one of those requirements. And so, you know, as the committee reconvened to, you know, bring the calendar back to the board that you've requested, do know that those are the things that are in the balance. And the reason some of those days are there is to meet both requirements. It's not enough to meet one. Ms. Harvey? I just wanted clarification. If we eliminate half days, Extends. does that extend the school year for students? We'll have, to, we'll have to make up those hours somewhere for, for the total number of student hours. 
so I'm not days, right? So I'm not saying just take off, either make them a full day or make it, so if you take two half days and put them together, then you have a full day, you'll still get the hours. So th just having that balance between either the full day off or full day on. Right. But there's hours and days, so, so it may be something, that's what the proposed calendar will do. It's either gonna extend something, shorten exactly. vacation something, but yes. okay. Um, any other further discussion or comments? So we had a motion, we had a second, we had a discussion. So may I have a roll call vote on the motion to bring a calendar that alters the amount of half days included. Is that the correct motion? So I'll, I'll amend that motion. Um, <laughs> and so to minimize, so how about that? Okay, minimize the number of half days. I would like them eliminated, but minimize okay. the number of half days. I'll, okay, I'll mm -hmm. second the amended motion. Okay, so may we have a roll call vote on the amended motion to minimize the number of half days in the current proposed calendar? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item, oh, no, we already did that one. No, okay, the next item on the agenda is a report on the Maryland comprehensive, is that word comprehensive? I know we had one comprehensive report already, but this one is on the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, MCAP, and for that, I think we have Dr. DiDonato, Dr. Jones, and Dr. Rogers is going to begin. Thank you. I'll be joined in a moment, uh, Dr. DiDonato, Chief Academic Officer, and Dr. Jones, Chief of Schools, uh, will take over the presentation. I just wanted to start by sharing um, the MCAP scores for 2023 have been released. As of today, um, additional data was released by the uh, Maryland uh, State Department of Education. Um, I am grateful for our hardworking staff and students uh, daily uh, who deserve our very best. Our data uh, further reinforces the need for us to prioritize academic achievement and prioritize making sure that we have highly effective uh, staff members across Team BCPS. While we have made modest gains in ELA and mathematics, there is much work to be done. Um, you will see based on a sample of mathematics problems that will be shared by Dr. DiDonato that literacy is truly our key to moving forward. Making sure that all students uh, can read and comprehend information uh, effectively is critically important. It has an impact not only in our ELA scores, but also in our mathematics scores and across all of our uh, subjects and schools. Um, this presentation, they will share an overview of the data that has already been released, uh, trends in terms of where our students are finding uh, the majority of difficulty in ELA and in mathematics, and our next steps, most importantly, our next steps that we're going to take as a school system uh, to improve. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. DiDonato. Good evening. Good evening, Vice Chair. Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Uh, thank you. Next slide. Uh, you do have uh, the presentation. I know the numbers on the screen are a little bit small, um, but the green columns um, represent our ELA results. Blue are our math results. There are two, year, two years of BCPS data accompanied by the third column, um, which is the MSDE Maryland data um, you can see grade three, five, eight. Um, Baltimore County, as you can see here, is trailing behind um, the state average. Next slide. So we know what our data shows. We know that we have some work to do. Part of digging into that work is really understanding um, our most uh, complex areas of need. So when we look at literacy, um, what you see on the screen on the left-hand side is um, the key uh, standards uh, that we, anchor standards that we are struggling with in BCPS. Um, they are listed in hierarchical order of uh, greatest challenge. 
one of the things that we notice about our anchor standards, um, they do anchor standards in reading do spiral across grade levels. So you'll see a standard that, um, for example, the key ideas and details, citing strong text evidence. You'll see the complexity of what students need to do when citing text evidence. They might need to use multiple sources, so citing from a variety of type of text or multiple text. Um, sometimes the citations are um, quoting directly versus making an inference and then adding that information. So the complexity of that skill you see from the very, very beginning of students recalling something in kindergarten and first grade um, and pointing to a picture of where that might be all the way to having multiple texts to look at. So when you see that uh, the reading informational text, so determining the central idea is a challenge. Um, determining and analyzing an author's point of view, so the structure um, that an author uses in order to convey information, um, key ideas and details, which is really uh, supporting your answer, so using text evidence. Um, you can see that actually in reading literature, our anchor standard that is uh, the most challenging for our students is, again, citing text evidence. So you can see that there's a standard that we're having difficulty with both in um, reading informational text as well as in literature. So when we're looking at how do we start making impacts of things, these, this type of data having the explicit information as far as standards that are most challenging for kids that allow us to see, allows us to see where we can focus instruction and the fact that it's across two different types of reading allows us to work with kids on creating consistency with being able to demonstrate that skill. Again, you can see another area with uh, craft and structure determining and explaining word choice for meaning and tone that often uh, is related to uh, looking at uh, author's point of view because how does an author convey information, how do they, what words do they use and choose that conveys certain information within a text. So you can see on this slide, again, these are the uh, standards that uh, students demonstrate the most uh, challenge with. Part of MCAP, um, the way questions are asked, not every student has every single question the same. So these are questions that more than 50% of students had. So there's questions that maybe only 10 students responded to. We wouldn't look at those anchor standards necessarily, but this had a large enough pool of students who answered questions in this area for us to identify it as an area of need. If you can go to the next slide. When we look at our math score, there's three types of math tasks off asked on the MCAP. The two on the screen are the areas that, um, again, we need to do our most work with. So type one tasks, which are not on the screen, that was an area of promise for us. Um, those type of tasks have students really demonstrate conceptual understanding, procedural skills. There's some reasoning and the ability to use mathematics to solve real world problems. This is more what you will see as computational type problems for the most part, and that's an area of strength for students. Again, when you look at those types of problems, they're primarily numbers in the problems. When we're looking at our more complex task types, like type two and three, just highlighting some key words in this, um, a student's ability to reason mathematically, in order to reason mathematically and explain your reasoning, you have to be able to communicate that information that ties directly into writing. Reading and writing are very connected. So when students need to reason, they not only need to think of the, vocab the math vocabulary related to that to explain their answers, they need to be then able to articulate it on the assessment. Um, if you keep reading some of those other key words in there, provide arguments of justification. So that's really, again, explaining in detail. So the complexity of writing that's required on math assessments is is truly uh, indicative of some of the work that we are hoping to see uh, make progress with our uh, reading scores. Type three tasks, um, again, under, uh, students' ability to understand, demonstrate their understanding of math when solving real world problems. So if you're able to demonstrate your understanding, that means you understand the complexity of the math problem that you're faced with. So you understand the question that it's asking, the information that's conveying. Before you even try to solve it, do you understand what the problem is asking you to do? You want to go to the next slide. So when we look at the area of math, and um, some of the domains where we had challenges, and again, we tried to break this up a little bit uh, with grades three through five together, and then looking at grades six through 10 and algebra. Um, numbers and operations, fractions, um, and place value is an area of growth for us. Numbers and operations with base 10. So looking at decimals, decimals and fractions um, are very much related to each other if you understand that um, 
a fraction written as one tenth, and that would also be equivalent to the decimal of zero decimal point one. That is important information to be able to uh, for a student to be able to transition between those two types of calculations. Um, that is an area really when we look at our elementary school um, grades for us to continue to work on. When you look at um, grades six through ten, the number system com compute fluently with multi-digit numbers. Um, that's really looking at our students' ability, not just 23 times 54, um, but really looking at um, the ability to do that within the context of word problems and story problems. So again, the understanding of what a task is asking you to do or how to solve something comes into play with this. Expressions and equations. Um, Again, looking at the connections between proportions, um, lines, linear equations, again, that often relies a lot of times on students' ability to compute fluently because they have to do multi-step problems when solving those kinds of things. Um, next slide, please. Just to give you a sample of some of the things that students may be asked to do, to do this is a sample type three task. I'll read it just for, uh, Two science classes are conducting an experiment together in the science lab. Each class has 23 students. The tables in the science lab can each seat up to four students. How many tables are needed for all the students from both classes? So you have a sample of one student's work there. The bottom is the uh, question that it asks. It says, so the what's displayed in orange is what the students are presented with. So this is one where they have to justify and provide an argument for how the Sample students solve the problem. Analyze the student's work. Is the answer reasonable? Explain how the student's work correctly or incorrectly represents the problem. Enter your answer uh, and your work or explanation in the space provided. You can also use the drawing tool. So when a student has to complete this task, first of all, they have to read that problem. So they need to understand all the language that is incorporated within that. They have to understand you know, the mathematical vocabulary that's within it. They also have to understand that vocabulary of is the of being asked, is the student's answer reasonable? So they not only have to answer the, look at the question, understand it, they have to look at the sample of how another student might have solved the problem, determine if that is appropriate, uh, appropriate way to solve the problem, and then explain why it is or isn't. Now they can explain in numbers, but they also need to explain in words. A simply mathematical or numeric number is usually not sufficient. Um, they need to include information about how they solved it, some sort of explanation using mathematical vocabulary. This is a sample of a fifth grade um, problem. So these are the things that our students are being asked to do. So when you look at the language and reading load of that type of problem, it really gives insight into the demands that need to happen in our math classes, as well as students coming into math with those foundational reading skills so that they can access that. Oftentimes in a math class during instructional time, if a student's having difficulty with reading, the teachers are going to provide that support to them. However, when on a standardized assessment, they're not able to have that type of support. So while we might be able to help them so that they are able to demonstrate an understanding in math of the mathematical computational skills, the ability to independently read the text is often a challenge. Next slide. So with all of that, what are we going to do about it? Good evening. Um, and as Dr. Ginato said, and I'm sure some of the things that you've heard said um, are things you kind of already know, but it was important for us to approach the MCAP this way, um, especially with Dr. Rogers assuming her role and those of us in our new roles, to be able to really think about what is it that we can change. And what we can change is what lies underneath the data. And so Dr. DiDonato took that opportunity to really just kind of explain some of the things that we're thinking about as a cabinet. How are we not just looking at the percentages, but what are we going to do about it? And so we are really looking at the um, evidence statements and conducting an analysis around the standards so that we can better um, support our teachers in making sure that they get what they need. And so what you see on the screen are some action items, um, who's responsible, and the timeline. And quite honestly, when we think about just based on the data and where we are with our current state and our, just our beliefs about teaching and learning and instructional leadership, we know that we need to implement an elementary curriculum. We need to implement a viable 
curriculum for our students, and that is top priority for us. So we are making sure that we are engaging our teachers in the science of reading, that we are providing instructional strategies, and then balancing that against the standards. And in small letters there, that's open court, and of course, HMH into reading. Um, we're kind of approaching this from a, um, a theory of action. We believe that if we implement this viable curriculum, and then we implement secondary intervention strategies, which we know the research says um, when students need support reading, you have to kind of do something. And so we're, we're, we're providing those strategies that we believe with the implementation of these evidence-based practices and then monitoring the imp implementation and providing a sense of interven intervention or monitoring efficacy, if you will, if we provide our educators with support, then we will see the desired outcomes. And so who is responsible? Quite honestly, just about everyone is here. <laughs> everyone is here from both of our departments. But we're really trying to kind of create a hand, all hands on deck approach to the work. Um, all of our teams are, um, are excited. Um, we're um, a little, you know, just kind of thinking about how we're going to all do this. But when the, the task is great, but we're, but we're ready for it. And then those are the dates. This is not an all-inclusive list around literacy. We are really um, thinking about how we're partnering with our external partners, thinking about some things that are already in place. But we wanted to really um, share that information. Um, next slide, please. Again, the same thing in mathematics. We believe that um, effective professional development um, with adequate time for teachers to learn, practice, implement, and reflect on new strategies helps to facilitate a change in their practice. Um, in mathematics, similar things apply. We've got to implement a curriculum that is aligned to the state standards. And so, of course, you know we are using bridges and illustrative math. And again, some of the things that Dr. DiDonato shared are informing our work, um, are forming our work with teachers, um, who is responsible. We have, of course, school-based staff, but then also how are we kind of transforming our work as central office to be able to respond to the needs of our schools. And we know that we have some, some um, able and willing teachers who are ready to do this work, but they need to be they need to be supported, so we want to build their capacity. We're also in conversations about leadership opportunities oper available in math through MSDE, um, where they have actually um, outsourced and or partnered with um, some of our familiar um, companies and organizations who are there to support us as well. And that's going to be more of like a PLC model that involves um, school-based staff, our executive directors from the Department of Schools, staff in CNI, and and even us as district leader um, or system leader staff. Next slide, please. We, we're kind of going to bring it all together and think about what can happen at the school level. We know that um, uh, coaching and teaching in real time also brings about impact. And a lot of the standards-based work, um, the implementation of the curriculum through um, fidelity, che fidelity checks, and then monitoring the assessment data. This is going to be very important. And I feel like um, our work that we can change is, is really understanding when to intervene and how to intervene. And um, Dr. Rogers has definitely made that um, a charge for us that when we um, see that students need additional supports or even our students who need to be challenged, quite honestly, what are we doing about it and how are we intervening and proactively moving, proactively moving forward? So again, you see who's responsible, a lot of us, all hands on deck and then just the timeline, and those are the PD days that um, were mentioned earlier. But again, outside of all of this, our goal is to really implement and plan against the standards with a viable curriculum, supporting teachers, making sure that everyone has transformed their thinking around providing the support so that we can make sure that our students get the gains that they need. Next slide, please. Any questions? Thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, also, thank you for really incorporating the action steps into it. Often we hear the, the what, but not like like you said, what what's next. With um, I have a question first, and then I'll, I'll call another board members. With the HMH being a new curriculum, I know that sometimes we're not going to see numbers move. As far, I mean, test scores may not move right away in that first year. So what are we going to use to really progress monitor that the implementation of that new elementary curriculum? So to your point, the first m metrics is really looking at the monitoring of implementation, so the fidelity of implementation. So doing um, fidelity checks not only at the school level, but staff from curriculum instruction, from the division of schools, going out together with school administrators to look at instruction to see is the quality of instruction, um, is it 
specific? Is it directed? Is it uh, in alignment with what the intention of the curriculum is, not just maybe the words on a page, but are they truly implementing it? And do they understand the standards that they're teaching through the curriculum? The other thing that we're doing is um, prof the professional learning for the school administrators. So not only do we need them to know and understand the curriculum, but how are they giving feedback to teachers about the curriculum and the things that they're observing? So um, on the 28th, we have our first professional learning day um, for the year for uh, school administrators. Um, during each of the sessions that they will go to, there is a emphasis on what is the curricular content that you should see in a classroom based on them becoming even more familiar with the curricular resources, where to access them, what do they expect to see in the classroom, and then what feedback would they provide based on what they see. They're going to see some sample videos of instruction where they're going to be able to dig into it and work together to then look at, okay, if you see this, what is a feedback or um, constructive support that you can provide for a teacher so that really the quality of the instruction is, is the focus the first year. Thank you. Um, and this is not a question, just a comment that listening to what you're saying and talking about the practices, just considering whether Danielson is providing us what we need for our principals to really measure the content that's, that's in the room. I know you mentioned that. Uh, what did you say? <laughs> Other, uh, just on the same page. Okay. You, no, no comment with that no, one? Okay. okay. <laughs> Next, Ms. Dominowski. Um, I'm, I kind of have an unpopular question. I'm looking at the data from 2022. Um, the proficiency rates for ELA 10 and Algebra 1 being at 46.3 and 6.6. .6. And our graduation rate that same year was 84.5%. So if the proficiencies are low, how, may, <laughs> how many of those students who were not proficient, and since these are graduation standards, were held back? Um, I would need to look into that. I don't have that kind of information on the ready, but that is something that we can look into. Is that something that we think about doing, or is it, uh, I know that some studies say that holding a child back is not, you know, doesn't benefit them, but if we're not, it doesn't seem to, I mean, the proficiency rates being what they are, I think we use all the tools available to get our kids where they need to be. Um, I, I would like to, that would be something I would want to see as far as, you know, the most far behind kids, are they getting, you know, the, the actual help services that they need, whether that, and including being held back a full year if they need to be. Dr. Rogers. Sure, Ms. Dominowski, thank you uh, for raising that, talking about uh, you know retaining students overall as a practice. I would share that our commitment is to making sure that students have the skills and the strategies that they need to move forward. Um, so while we probably don't have uh, rich data in terms of uh, students' reading levels and you know how that bears out with their graduation rates, because there's a variety of um, uh, mitigating circumstances, for example, if you have had uh, individualized education plan and your specific area of need is literacy. Growth might not take you to 12th grade when you are graduating. You might not be graduating with a diploma. Um, but with that said, our commitment is to improving academic achievement. And so um, I think there are probably some um, historical pieces of data that can be provided to you. Uh, what we will provide moving forward is how we're monitoring students' level of readiness. And I think uh, Dr. DiDonato and Dr. Jones and the team, we're all committed to uh, making sure that we're not only implementing the curriculum with Fidelity, providing that professional learning, but that as the central office that we are engaging in PLCs. So we're looking at the grades in the grade books, but that's one piece and one measure. We're also looking at how our students are going to perform on our district assessments because those are aligned with the state assessments. Then we're going to go back with central office when we see specific standards and specific areas where students aren't doing well. What is it that we need to send out to schools? What do, is it that we need to uh, plan for the next week or the next you know few weeks so that there aren't these surprises when it comes to the state assessments? The state assessments are certainly one measure. They're an important measure, but we are going to do our due diligence that uh, to ensure that across multiple measures, we start to see that improvement in our students and certainly can provide more robust data moving forward in terms of the correlation between graduation rate and uh, retention uh, of students. Ms. Stileski. Thank you. This may be what you were speaking of, but um, is it possible to get uh, data 
connecting and taking away IEP students because that's a unique group um, and possibly even ESOL students. But for um, you know the majority of Baltimore County students to get the like reading level for the graduation rates for years going forward, you know, to, to just ensure that we're we have some kind of um, baseline data on graduation rates and how it connects to how well students read, and, and maybe that's years going forward. that's and that may be what you were speaking of. Yes, about. yes, years going forward, and you know, making sure that we can, you know, for most students, you have the MAP growth data that shows you the reading levels. Uh, that kind of you know stops at a certain age, uh, depending on the student whether or not they need an intervention. But certainly, for moving forward to having that correlation of data is something that we could do. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Pumphrey? Just a quick question. I apologize. You may have already said this or maybe even a prior, in a prior meeting, but as far as the monthly um, fidelity checks that are done by Division of Curriculum Instruction and Department of Schools, the individuals that are going out and doing these fidelity checks, are, have they also been um, provided with training in our new ELA curriculum? So the, it's staff from the central office who are actually delivering the training and professional development to teachers and leaders. So it's our, you know, director of English language arts, our coordinators, um, our coordinator of elementary language arts, um, as well as our secondary math staff um, and our director of uh, ELA who has provided extensive training on um, the reading interventions that we're providing to staff. So she's a part of all of those. So yes, and we've been working with the division of schools to make sure that the executive directors have the same level of training so they're, we're all on the same page as far as what we're looking for when we go into classrooms and when we're working with administrators. Thank you. No problem. Ms. Frampong has a question. She wants to know the timeline for PD and fidelity checks clearly specified but not for monitoring, for monitoring of assessment data. What is the frequency that we can expect for the monitoring and progress? So the reason we put the timeline about aligned to the administration of, C of CBAs, of curriculum-based assessments, they're given at different times across grade levels. And so in that tiny little box, it was not possible to uh, provide all of that information. But as soon as there's a window for which assessments can be given, because we do know there's pep rallies at schools and things that come up in a school um, or students might have struggled with a certain skill and so a teacher may make a decision that you know a percentage of the class is struggling with this skill I'm going to approach it a different way and try to reteach it to see if you know that that has better connects with students so there is a window for which um, assessments are given what we've provided to schools is a scheduled by quarter so within marking period one curriculum based assessment um, one and two for first first grade needs to be administered. Um, so we've provided that to schools, so it gives them a window of when they need to complete it, but it gives very specific targets. So the monitoring of it would be at the close of each marking period, um, but we can do it during the marking period to see where they were, what were the results of you know a first assessment um, prior to giving the second one later in the marking period. And I guess I would just add add to that that when we because um, I was I was actually just looking at the end of unit one <laughs> dates um, some dates are actually coming up in terms of just unit one um, to think it's been a month of school already so anywhere between um, the first week in October to about mid October there should be some sort of curriculum based assessment depending on the grade and depending on the um, the unit so um, I, it, it's weeks of instruction and then. Um, the assessment comes, but like Dr. DiDonato said, there are so many different um, so many different windows. But I do know, just in um, preparation for some things for tomorrow and the team that I was looking, and we do have some coming up around um, next week and going into um, mid October, November. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. So thank you for this and presenting it in such a comprehensive way. Like I am confident that this plan will work if it's implemented well, and I know you all are going to make sure that it is implemented well. Um, and so just in speaking to that, if we could go to slide two, the, um, those MCAT results. So just to make sure that I'm reading everything correctly. Mm -hmm. So for grade eight math, in 2002 and 2020, in, in um, 2023, approximately 99% of our students did not score at the proficient level. That's correct. That correct. And so then what is the performance target for this year and for next year? 
um, because it's a, you know, there's, so there's hope because we see in grade five, those students, they performed a little better. And so the thought is that, okay, these grade five students are now in grade six, you're implementing some good practices. So they'll get that in grade six, grade seven, when they go take that assessment again in grade eight, they should be well prepared. We should see, you know, skyrocket growth. So what are, what's the, um, do you, have you all started to map out those performance targets for, um, the cohort of students, so these grade five students that will eventually go to grade eight, and then even for this year's students? So MSD provides those targets based on, uh, th so this is an aggregate of all schools, so MSD does provide those targets based on individual schools as well as um, specific student group targets. So yes, we want to continue to see, when we look at cohort data, cohorts of students continue to improve as they move forward. Some things that we need to, you know, can to consider with math. So of those grade five students who took the grade five assessment, some of them will take al the algebra exam in eighth grade and not, or in seventh, seventh grade um, or eighth grade and won't be part of the algebra one takers in high school. So that group of eighth graders is not necessarily the same group of fifth graders that took the fifth grade assessment because they might not take that assessment, they're gonna take the Algebra One assessment. So there is some variability with that. So it's not, you have a much easier time tracking cohorts of students at the elementary level um, where they're going to take, because even if you're in advanced five math, you're still taking the grade five MCAP. I'd like to add on too that one of the things that actually has come out of the transition report that we are talking about is what will our targets be and how will we measure our attainment of those targets. And so yes, we are thinking very, um, very deeply about it, um, and we feel like we have a whole lot of promise here. Yeah. Definitely, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, any further questions or comments from board members? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the report, the comprehensiveness, and just the kind of authentic dialogue that we had. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates. So I will start with the audit committee, because alphabetically that's A, Mr. McMillian, so any updates? Uh, just our next meeting is Tuesday, October 17th at 4.30 virtually. I encourage everyone to uh, tune in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Budget Committee, Ms. Domanowski. Uh, yes, we had our first back-to-school Budget Committee meeting last week on September 20th. Our next meeting is October 18th virtually at 5.30. Um, where we are requesting an update on the Budget 101 website. Thank you. Um, building and Contracts, Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next Building and Contracts meeting is Monday, October 9th at 5 p.m. virtually. We invite everyone to attend. Thank you. Um, curriculum Committee is next. That is me. We um, are really digging into a lot of the curriculum work that Dr. Dinanato is laughing over there. We're really digging into it, um, especially the monitoring piece. Um, we went over our time last at our last meeting, so we actually added another meeting for Thursday, this Thursday. So there is a curriculum committee meeting this Thursday focusing on the implementation of HMH. Um, and then our regularly scheduled one is next Thursday. We're a very dedicated committee. Um, so that is on October 5th. Um, so, and again, we will spend more time really looking at the curriculum. Next is the Equity Committee, and that's Dr. Savoy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Equity Committee meetings met on September 20th at Christina. I'm so, I'm so sorry. The Equity Committee meeting met on September 20th, 2023 at 4 o'clock p.m. Uh, Mr. Douglas Handy gave us an outline of several topics that he will address in the future. The biggest takeaway was the topic of having an equity liaison position in the school. The liaisons would focus on providing resources for each student to ensure that they succeed. And the next meeting will be held on October 5th, 2023. Thank you. Next committee is um, Legislative and Governmental Relations and Ms. Booker Dwyer is the chair of that. So we are counting down to the legislative session. We are excited about that. Our first meeting will be on November 30th, and then we will ramp it up once the um, session is um, started to two meetings a month, and then we'll ramp it back down in April and celebrate <laughs> when it's over. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. And our last committee is our policy review committee, Ms. Pumphrey. 
Thank you. I just wanted to mention that out at our last um, committee meeting on September 18th, we had an AI presentation, um, and staff is going to come back to us regarding w whether or not they recommend a, pol a new policy regarding AI or if one of our current policies need to be updated to include specific language regarding AI. So I would encourage board members to go back and watch that presentation. I think it was very informative. Um, and our next uh, meeting is scheduled for October 16th. Thank you. And just a reminder for the public that all of the meetings are um, videoed, so if you can tune in at that time, you can watch them um, at a later date. Next are any agenda items that any board members want to bring forward, so um, please raise your hand if you have anything you want um, considered. Um, Ms. Booker DeWire? For a future board meeting, um, so we have all these committees. Could we have a presentation or uh, a vote on the purpose and the, the, the actions or just we need to get the level set on all these committees and what really is their purpose? What are they charged to do? Um, we did that in our last budget committee and that was helpful. Um, and so I appreciate Ms. Hen for sharing kind of the what, what happened previously. So if, um, if we could just get an idea of really what's the purpose of all these committees and what are they charged to do? And then maybe if we can all agree on it as a board and vote on it to make sure that we're all in alignment with, you know, the, the revised vision and direction for the school system, um, that would be helpful. Okay. I think that information is included in our handbook, which is one of the ad hoc committees. So there may be a way to, um, to kind of merge the two of those. Thank you. Um, I think I saw somebody else's hand for... Ms. Hen for agenda item? No, I was just going okay. to add and thank Ms. Booker Dwyer for bringing that up. I think the handbook should include the vision, mission, and goals of each of the committees. I right. think that would be helpful. So, right, so that'll, yeah. well, right. Ms. Um, Frempong, who is still on, is the chair of that ad hoc. So um, we'll get with her. Another, any other? Okay, let me see where we are. Um, Okay, the last item on the agenda is announcements, and the board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 10th, 2023 at 630. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned.